Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa rasulullah. Hadith number 218. Page number 155. Chapter. chapter the one who does not thank the people. Abu Hurairah said, the Prophet sallallahu said, the one who does not thank the people is not grateful to Allah. Okay. okay. This hadith might confuse some. See, the ibadat are divided, or let's rephrase that. The actions can be forms of worship and can be not forms of worship. So asking is a form of worship when you ask Allah, but asking people is not a form of worship when the people can do something for you. So if I ask you to help me in what you are able to help me, come and help me carry this table and you are capable of doing it. Is this shirk? No, because it is within your ability. But if I ask you to bring life to my dead son, then this is not in your ability. If I ask you to tell me what will happen in the future, if I ask you to make rain fall, all of this is shirk because you're asking other than Allah over things that no one is capable of doing except Allah. Now in this hadith, the Prophet is telling us about expressing your gratitude, being thankful. So one would be asking, is it permissible to thank other than Allah? Or is this shirk? No, it's not shirk. On the contrary, it's part of worshipping Allah. So Allah Azza wa Jal wants you to express your appreciation to your fellow Muslim brother who has given you or who has done you a favor. Otherwise, Allah will be angry with you. This hadith shows that the one who does not thank people is not grateful to Allah. What does this mean? The, does this mean? It can be either one. Either it refers to the person who does not show his gratitude to people. Such a person most likely will never thank Allah Azza wa Jal by nature. A person who has this built in his nature, not to thank people for doing him a favor, usually the high percentage is such a person would not show his gratitude to Allah would be always complaining and not thankful to Allah Azza wa Jal. And the second interpretation would be that Allah, the Almighty, even if you thank Him and show appreciation to Him, will not accept it from you unless you express your gratitude to others. And this shows us that we do not live on an island. We live in a community. So we have to show our appreciation to others. We have to show them that we do understand the effort and the lengths they had taken in order to do us a favor. How do we thank people? It's very easy. Express your feelings. Pay back by doing good things to them. Saying a good word. The hadith, the Prophet says, alayhi salatu wasalam, whoever does you a favor, repay him as much as you can. And if you cannot repay him, then make dua for them until you feel this suffices. Make dua. How easy is that? Very easy. And the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, whoever does you a favor and you say to him, jazakallahu khayran, 
then he has exceeded in thanking and appreciating him. The word is very little, huh? Jazakallahu khairan. What does it mean? May Allah reward you with goodness. This is dua. So you give me a favor, you do me a favor, you help me change the tire. Thank you. This is not yani, uh, 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 bringing satisfaction. But when you say, may Allah reward you, Allahu Akbar, that I would expect my compensation to come from Allah. If you compensate me, peanuts. But when Allah compensates me and rewards me, this is beyond my imagination. And this is why it is an old habit of mine that whenever someone does something to me, I make dua for them. And I say it without intending it. Oh, Sheikh, this is not rewardable. La ilaha illallah. We're coming back to the same problem. The issue of reward and intention, the brothers have يعني, confusion in that. Maybe I did not display it correctly. Maybe people have sensitivity towards it. Let me go back to my topic. Later on we will discuss it, inshallah. So it's a habit that whenever someone does something to me, I thank them by giving dua. And I intend the dua, but I don't pay attention to it. But it has an overwhelming impact on them. And when I consider what I say, mm, that's nice. I would love people to say this to me. I say, Rahimallah waldaik wa farallahu lak. May Allah for, have mercy on your parents and forgive you for anything. And the people take a step back and say, Jazakallah khair, may Allah reward you for these beautiful words. I don't pay attention to saying it and having this impact. But believe me, a word has a strong impact on people. So showing your appreciation, especially to the nearest and closest people to you, has a profound impact. Whether it's a child, when you encourage them, whether it's your wife. Imagine in Ramadan, how long do our wives spend in the kitchen? Not less than three hours, four hours. When you break your fast with the dates, what's the first comment? Ah, the soup needed some salt. The sambusa is overcooked. And uh, this is that, and this is... This is devastating. No matter what, praise your wife's cooking. <laughs> Seriously. My wife knows I'm a big liar. Whenever she cooks food, and I've been married for 33 years, whenever she cooks food, she usually makes mistakes. Either it's burnt, too salty, too raw. I eat and I speak while eating. If it's bad, I eat three morsels, four morsels. I eat a lot of salad. And alhamdulillah, may Allah Azza wa Jal grant you Jannah, you beautiful food. In Arabic we say, Tislam al-Ayadi. May your hands be healthy and to... And she looks at me while I'm eating and she says, you're lying. The food is horrible. Why don't you say so? Why don't you speak? I said, how long have you spent in the kitchen cooking it? Did you intend it this way? It so happened. And if it happens, I appreciate your effort, not the result. Because I have so many shortcomings. If you start picking them up, I'll be doomed. I never take you out. Seriously, I never take her out at all. We never travel. I don't take you to restaurants. I don't buy you gifts. I don't say good words. And you want me to complain? 
about your cooking or about the house or about my clothes not being ironed, I should be ashamed of myself. So this way of reciprocating, of appreciation, you live happy life. You don't eat well, but you live a happy life because we all have our shortcomings. You must show your gratitude to others in order so Allah Azza wa Jal would grant you or would appreciate and reward you for what you do. 258. Hadith 258. Page. Page 181. Okay. Chapter Consultation. Al Hassan said, People never seek advice without being guided to the best possible possibility available to them. Then he recited, and whose, whose affairs are a matter of counsel. Uh, chapters 42, Ashura, verses 38. Okay, so consultation. Who is the Hassan mentioned here? The companion of the Prophet ﷺ? The grandson? Or the Tabi'i? He's Al Hassan Al Basri, one of the greatest of the Tabi'in, whose words they used to say resembles the Prophet's hadith because he was up brought in the house of the wife of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, Um Salama, if I'm not mistaken. Consultation in Arabic is istishara, aw shura. This has a great role in Islam. There's an old saying for the scholars, some make it a hadith, but it is not a hadith. It is a famous, well-known statement. مَا نَدِمَ مَنِسْتَشَارْ وَمَا خَابَ مَنِسْتَخَارْ He who seeks consultation will never regret it. And he who prays istikhara will never fail. Now, istishara or shura is mentioned in the Quran. Allah Azza wa Jal says, so, be, so by the mercy of Allah, you were lenient with them. And if you had been rude and harsh in heart, they would have this uh, banded you from about you. So pardon them, ask forgiveness for them, and consult them. So Allah is ordering who? The messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, to consult. And also Allah says, and those who have responded to their Lord and established prayer and whose affairs is determined by consultation among themselves. So it's part of our deen to consult, to seek guidance. And this is an amana. What is meant by amana? It is something to be entrusted with. Why? Because when someone comes to you and seeks your consultation, you have to be fearing Allah Azza wa Jal and give them the right consultation. You must not consult someone who is inexperienced. And you must not consult someone who does not have the piety and righteousness. Why? If you ask and consult someone who is inexperienced, what will happen? He will give you the wrong consultation. Imagine you have stomachache, you have pain in your stomach, and you go to a dentist. What will he do for you? He will extract your wisdom tooth and charge you for it. But your pain will remain. So you have to seek consultation from an experienced person. In marriages, so many times people when they have problems, they go to someone who is inexperienced. A man comes to me, Sheikh, my wife did this and this and this and this and this. 
I say, A'udhu Billah, divorce this so-and-so. Divorce her. This is inexperience. A woman, so many women come to me and say, my husband did this and this and this. And please advise. I said, I will not advise you. Why, Sheikh? I have to listen to his side of the story. Sometimes I listen to the sister. I say, your husband has to be hanged. But then the husband comes in the afternoon and says, my wife did this and this and this. And I said, your wife has to be put in front of a firing squad. At night, I bring them both together and I listen to them. Half of what he said and half of what her sa of, of she said were lies. They do not repeat them in front of each other. Whenever I present my case, I always try to show the good points in my side and my favor. So you should and must ask someone with experience in whatever you do. You want to start a business, you don't go to someone who has no experience in business. You want to start farming, you don't go to an expert in industry. He doesn't have any knowledge in farming. And he has to be righteous and pious. Why? Because he might cheat. You go to someone and he doesn't fear Allah and tell him, uh, you, you know that sister? MashaAllah, Tabarakallah, she knows the Quran by heart and she knows the six books of Sunnah and she has great knowledge in Islamic studies and by the way she's a revert and before she accepted Islam she was a beauty queen and she knows how to dance ballet and plays the violin and she speaks seven languages and she is this feature and so so do you think it's good if I propose to her what would he say A'udhu Billah a woman like that with such a past and history. Ya akhi, fear Allah. Marry someone who is pure and Muslim. So, oh, thank you, Zakallah khair. He goes and marries her. <laughs> so consult someone who fears Allah and who is experienced. Now, if you uh, manage to do this, you will find that there is stage two. So I consult, I take feedback from people, from the elders, from the experienced. What is stage two? What, what to do next? Hmm? Hmm? Istikhara. You pray istikhara. And the issue of istikhara will come inshallah later on, hopefully before the day is over. And there is a lot of talk about it how to do it, the results, do we see a window opening from the heavens saying, do it, or do we uh, see a dream, or what, what it, so pe me, people have confusion about istikhara, we will come into that inshallah. The following uh, hadith, 277. 277, page number 192, uh, chapter the contentment of the self. <clears throat> and I said, I served the Prophet wasallam for 10 years. He never said oof to me and he never said about something I had not done. Why didn't you do that? Or something I had done. Why did you do that? Authentic. Now this is a hadith which is well known in the Sahih. We all know it by heart. And this shows us the personality of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. In commenting on this hadith, I made only four pages. Believe it or not. And I was thinking of tomorrow's lecture. You can make a difference. Should I put it? Until now I haven't decided. It's, I need 24 hours before. Now it's 20, like 8 or 30. So it's not time yet for me to think about. Either to have it on this topic, similar to it, you can make a difference in your life and the people's life on the personal level, or to expand it and talk about our difference that we can make in the society. 
in the ummah. Can we make a difference in the level of the ummah? So until now, I'm not decided. Maybe Haj Arif would help me later on say, this is a long topic, very long topic. But I will not go through it because we have to cover the material. But I'll just give you a hint. If one of your employees does a mistake, do you look the other way or interrogate him? This is a personal thing. When your wife does something wrong, okay, let's help the brothers. When your husband does something wrong, do you nag on his head and you remind him for the next 30 years, you've done this and this and this and this 30 years ago. Why did you do this? I tolerated you. I forgave you. What forgave you? You're reminding me five times a day like prayer. <laughs> without adhan, without iqama. Every day, five times a day, you remind me of your forgiveness. What kind of forgiveness is this? This is a deficiency in our character. The Prophet is teaching us, alayhi wa not to do this. You remember Yusuf? They took him, threw him in the well. He was imprisoned. Then he became the Aziz of Musr. They come to him. He accuses his younger brother so that he can abduct him and take him in his custody of stealing. And when they come and say, what happened? They tell them that the younger one stole because they found the measurement uh, um, cup in his luggage. What did they say? Well, if he had stolen it, his brother had stolen before. Whom are they referring to? Yusuf. They accused him falsely, falsely, falsely of stealing. What Allah says in the Quran, فَأَسَرَّهَا يُوسُفُ فِي نَفْسِهِ وَلَمْ يُبْدِهَا لَهُمْ He concealed it in himself and he did not react to it. This beautiful characteristic is known as التغافل. There is no word in my knowledge in, in English to explain it. In Arabic, it means looking the other way. When something happens, do not investigate. Do not insist on finding why. Move on. If we deal like this, we would be very happy. No problems in our marriages, in our work, in our relationships. When you look the other way. So many examples, so many beautiful things. It's not the time. It's a separate lecture. Maybe tomorrow, maybe not. What did the Prophet do, alayhi salatu wasalam? This is how the Prophet was. Whenever Anas, who was his servant for 10 years, who was a child, he never complained. We have subordinates. We have drivers. We have workers. How do we deal with them? The Prophet said, or Anna said, the Prophet, whenever he looked at something I did, he would not reprimand me. Why did you do this? And if I did not do it, he would not reprimand me by saying, shouldn't you have done so and so? No, the Prophet Islam, let it go. And the people with high aspiration would not repeat the same mistake twice. When I do something wrong and my boss does not talk to me about it, I feel ashamed. I know he knows. And next time I will not do it. Because I don't want to bring this feeling again. And I don't want to yeah, uh, um, make him lose hope in me, in a sense. Now, compare what we do with this hadith, how many times we talk to our wives, why didn't you do this? 
Why didn't you do that? How many times I tell you, you have to do this, put this in place. I know brothers that are taunting their wives. Wallahi, when they come into the house, I know a brother who's a relative of mine. The minute he comes to the house, he does this. And he looks at his wife with a, a scary look. Khalas, this is sufficient. Why? Just pick it and move. There are people who make life difficult to others. They question them. They interrogate them. Look at the beautiful hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Oh, Prophet of Allah, how many times should we overlook and forgive the shortcomings of a servant? He's my servant. So the man is asking, how many times? What do you expect the Prophet to say? He said, 70 times a day. 70 mistakes a day. Is this logical? This is Islam. Look the other way and things will rectify it itself. But when you insist on investigating, why did you do this? This is wrong. You should not have done this. I warned you before. This causes friction and tension and life cannot go on like this well. So we move on to hadith number 302. Hadith 302, page 207, chapter Cheerfulness. And Nawas ibn Sam'an al-Ansari said, he asked the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa about righteousness and sin. He said, righteousness is good character and sin is what pricks on your heart of and which you dislike for other people to become aware of. Authentic. طيب. This hadith is a great hadith and an explanation of the concise of speech that the Prophet was given alayhi salatu wasalam. Very eloquent. Very short but very concise. The Prophet alayhi salam was asked about righteousness. About al-bir. And the bir in Arabic has vast, big and wide meaning. So the Prophet answered alayhi salatu wasalam, al-birru husnul khuluq. Righteousness is good character. Is this it? Isn't salat part of righteousness? Isn't fasting, zakat? It is to highlight the importance of good character. Like when the Prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam, al-hajju arafa. What does it mean? It doesn't mean that if I only go for Arafah and then return home, I have performed Hajj. No. There is Ihram, there is Tawaf al Ifada, there is Sa'i al Hajj. All of these are pillars of Hajj. If you don't do them, your Hajj is invalid. So, what does the Prophet mean? He means that the most major pillar of Hajj is Arafah. And likewise, to be righteous. If you pray, if you fast, if you give zakat, that, these are all righteous deeds. If you don't have good character, you're not righteous. I could pray all night long. I could fast every Monday and Thursday. I could give my money in zakat. But if I am rude, if I'm inconsiderate, if I am selfish, if I don't pay attention, to your feelings, if I'm not generous, I am not righteous. So this hadith <coughs> highlights a very important aspect which the Muslims should work very hard on. This is why we have the adab al-mufrad. This good character is the main aspect of adab. To be kind to people. You hear so many things. And you have to fix your inside, your heart, the way you behave. So many times I get people coming to me and commenting on a hadith. Or explaining a story for me. And I know the story better than they. 
and I can say it better than them. But I have to, out of good character, pretend that I have not heard it and said, hmm, MashaAllah, SubhanAllah. So after half an hour, he concludes his story feeling that he had done something good and say, ha ha, I know it. How does he feel? Or if I interrupt him, if I correct him. So part of the good character is to fix your shortcomings. And this needs training. This doesn't come all of a sudden. It needs a mon uh, someone who guides you, who teaches you, who gives you your shortcomings in a way so that you can fix and help that. The second part is about sin and burden. What is the word? <laughs> and just like and sin in the hadith is al ithm, which is a wider meaning of adhamb, sin. So sin, the definition of it is what pricks in your heart and which you dislike for other people to become aware of. Which means that even if you don't have knowledge of the Quran and the Sunnah, there are things that are natural that the majority of human beings agree upon. So even Muslims and non-Muslims agree that killing is unlawful. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to know this. Stealing people's property is unlawful. Lying is unlawful. Slandering, cursing, beating, being rude. All of these are what? Universally known to people not to be lawful. So the Prophet is directing us, alayhi salatu salam, that if this feeling of sin, being ashamed of it, this feeling that pricks in your heart, it doesn't feel good. And you don't want others to know about it. So maybe I do something and I'm doubtful whether it's a sin or not. But sure enough, I don't want you to know about it. Then this is an indication that it is what? This is a sin. When I don't want people to know about it and I'm hesitant to acknowledge that it is a sin, then it is a sin. This feeling, this natural feeling of concealing it makes it a sin. Hadith number 313. Hadith 313, page 213. Chapter? Um, chapter, the believer is not a defamer. Okay. Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, said, the Prophet wasallam said, a person with two faces cannot be a trustee, authentic and sound. So, a person with two Faces. What do we mean by two faces? And like putting a mask? What is meant by two faces? Two faces person is a hypocrite who comes to the sinners and he enjoys sins and he's having fun and he's saying you're the people to hang out with. Then when he goes to the righteous people, he pretends that he is righteous, he holds the prayer beads. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. So such a person is two-faced person. And he also, or this also can refer to a person who transmits chit-chatting and gossips. So he goes to this group and talks to them and listens to what they have to say, then goes to the other group and says, they said so and so and so about you. So they retaliate and say bad things about them. He goes again to them and say, Wallah, they responded by saying this and this and this. He causes what? He causes enmity. He causes friction. 
he causes tension between the Muslims. And this is why Allah Azza wa Jal cannot or this person cannot be trusted. How can you trust someone with two faces? Not only that, the Prophet said in the authentic hadith alayhi salatu wasalam, whoever has two faces in this world on the day of judgment, he will have two tongues of fire. This is his punishment that his, fire, his tongues will be split into two and they will be of fire torturing his interior, his inside because of the lies of the deceit that he used to do. Now, we have a question, we have a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari where the Prophet والسلام, was sitting among his companions when a man sought permission to enter. So they told the Prophet so-and-so is seeking permission to enter. Shall we allow him in? The Prophet said, A'udhu Billah, in a sense, in translation roughly. The worst of the tribe's son or the tribe's brother is so-and-so. Naming him by name. Allow him in. So he came in and to the surprise of Mother Aisha, she said that the Prophet والسلام, smiled in his face, made him sit beside him, talked to him, and then the man left. Now, you, you can see the difference. The Prophet said the worst of the people's son or tribe is this man who's coming in. But then he <coughs> met him with a different face. Aisha said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, you said so and so, and then you dealt with him in a different fashion. The Prophet said, O oh, Aisha, the worst of people is the one who people protect themselves from him, fearing his evil and foul language. Now, this hadith caused the, the, the scholars to look into it. By no means it is two faces from the Prophet ﷺ. Is the Prophet can be that like that? No way. No Muslim would think of this. So how can we interpret, how can we understand this? The answer is, meeting people with kindness is something that you do of your own good. For example, he took my money and I said, keep it. I forfeited my right. Is there any haram in it? Is there any haram? No. He insulted me. I said, I forgive you. Is there any haram on me? No. He is drinking intoxicants in my presence and I remain silent. Is there any haram on me? Yes. So this is in Arabic called mudahana and mudara. Mudahana is to give in in the Islamic aspects, this is prohibited. Allah mentioned in Surah Al-Qalam, what do law tudhinu fayudhinun? They wish that you compromise your religion so that they can compromise. Yani you come to a mutual ground. This is not permissible. In religion, you have to draw the line. When it comes to your own favors and your own rights and your own possessions, Islam tells you, give away. So what the Prophet did alayhi salatu wasalam, was this type. When the man sought permission to come, the companions were sitting around the Prophet noticing every single thing he does. The Prophet feared because of his nature of meeting people with a smile, being generous to, being kind to, he was afraid that the companions would think that this person 
is a righteous, pious, scholarly like. So they would think great of him and would be misled. So he had to make it clear to everyone that this man is one of the worst people on earth. But because it is my nature that I do not reject people or treat, him, treat them rudely, I'm giving you this warning. So when he came, he behaved as usual. This is not two faces. The two faces is the one who causes corruption, who meets a righteous and pious person, and he talks with him nicely, mashallah, and he goes to the others and say, this guy is evil. He does this, he does that, just to cause problems between people. So I hope this makes sense to you. The following hadith in the notes is 361. I think we will pass this because يعني, I think it is not of great importance as it is not a hadith of the Prophet but rather it is from the companion. So we would like to focus more on the uh, Prophet's sayings. Hadith, hadith. Mm -hmm. page. Uh, page 260. Chapter, the person who is patient when people injure him. Ibn Umar said, the Prophet وسلم, said, the believer who mixes with people and puts up with their abuse is better than the person who does not mix with the people and does not put up with their abuse. Authentic. So the Prophet والسلام, is telling us that there are two types of people. Type one who mixes with others, interacts with them, answers and accepts their invitations, invite them to their or to his events. Yet through the process, he is tolerant. Because when you mix with people, inevitably you have to get harm. This is a well-known fact. If you befriend someone, you will benefit, but you will get some harm. If you mix with a group of Muslims, you will see things that may not be appropriate. You may have to bring it to their attention. They may attack you accordingly. Because when people are advised, they are a little bit more or less defensive. They don't accept. You would not accept if I say, Akhi, why are you doing this? Immediately you become defensive. But if I speak about the same sin on someone else, although you're doing it, you say, Subhanallah, I don't know how people behave like this. Because it's not you. It's someone else. And this is why the best form of advice is the advice that comes indirectly. The Prophet, when he used to see something wrong, he used to come to the pulpit and say, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam Rasulullah. Why do so and so people behave in such a fashion? And he does not address that individual. This, this is the best way of doing it so that you can break the ice and make people accept your advice. So this is type one. Type two are those who do not want headache. So they say, listen, I, if I mix with people, they cause problems, we fight, they don't like me, they uh, 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 backbite me and I backbite them. Tell you what, I will stay home, I will not go out, I will not answer any invitation, and this way I will be safe. Now, this is your right. You can do this. No one is forcing you to come out. But what is more rewarding to Allah Azza wa Jal? If you stay back home and pray, or if you mix with people and advise them and teach them and tolerate their abuse, definitely the latter. So in this hadith, the Prophet is highlighting that you have to be active have to be tolerant, have to be patient, because life is not easy, is it? Is life easy? 
Would you like to stand up just to shake up some of the sleep? Let's stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. The weather is, mashallah, fine. It's not cold. Yet I see a lot of the brothers are asleep. So let's stand up, stand up, stand up. Masha'Allah. Okay. I'll sit. No, I'm joking. Okay, just, you know, stretch, do something useful. Check your SMS, WhatsApp. Utilize your time. Don't waste your time. Yalla, bismillah, sit down. Okay. So, this is an encouragement for you to mix with others, to tolerate, to be patient. However, there are other hadiths that go against this. And this is in the times of tribulation and fitan. The Prophet tells us that there will come a time when the best of you would be a man with few of his sheep at the top of a mountain, eating and drinking from these sheep and worshipping Allah, staying away from people. So how can we understand this? We can understand that it depends on what? The pros and cons. Someone says, Sheikh, I have a rage problem. If I open my mouth, 10 seconds later, I end up beating the man. Anyone who says anything, I cannot tolerate. I know people like this. I know practicing brothers, every other week he's coming with a black eye or what is this? Well, I met someone, I told him, Akhi, this is haram. He said, it's not of your business. I spanked him and we had a fight and we ended up in the police station. Oh, wallahi, I tell him, Akhi, I, don't, I will not tell you shave your beard because this is a sin. But what you're doing is more sinful. You're giving us a bad reputation. He said, what can I do? I cannot tolerate this. Some people, when they say evil, when they see evil, they forbid it, which is good. كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ تَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ This is excellent. But if it's going to cause a bigger problem, don't do it. Allah says, do not curse the idols if it would lead for the idol worshippers to curse Allah. Cursing the idols is good. They are false they're nothing but stones. But if this would lead them to curse Allah, which is bad, then refrain. Don't do it. So measuring the consequences is an extremely important aspect in Islam. Therefore, this hadith is general. Individuals who fail to comply, we would say, stay away. If you open your mouth, you cause devastation, shut up. Sit back, relax, extend your feet, watch uh, uh, television or the news, don't go out. But generally speaking, no, you have to train yourself. Life is not paved with flowers and roses. There is hardship. If I come and tell my wife to do something Islamically, she says, look at yourself, do this and that first. This happens. You come to a brother or a friend, Akhi, you're doing this sin. This is not permissible. Allah says so and so. So I'm just giving you advice in the cause of Allah. Jazakallah khair. Cut your nails first. Oh, sorry. I didn't know that my nails were long. But what does this have to do with that? Touche. You saw my mistakes. I saw your mistakes. What, what kind of Muslims are you? Once you get the advice, say, Jazakallah khair. Take it, accept it, implement it. Why must it be personal? If you see my mistakes, I see your mistakes. Okay, assume I did not see your mistakes or brought it to your attention. Then I will hush hush. Subhanallah. Then your intention was not for the sake of Allah when you corrected me. It was just to get even. And this shows you how bad Muslims can be 
when they do not do what they do for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. Okay. Uh, 422. Hadith 422, page 282, 282. Chapter Providing Water. Laith reported that Tawus said that Ibn Abbas said, I think he ascribed it to the Prophet. Uh, the doubt was from Laith. There are 360 joints in, man, in mankind, and each of them owes sadaqah. Every single day, every good word is sadaqah. A, man, a man's helping his brother is sadaqah. His drink of water which he gives is sadaqah. Removing something harmful from the road is sadaqah. Authentic due to supporting proofs. Okay, this hadith is one of different versions. The Prophet والسلام, said that there are 360 joints in a man, in a person, in a human being. So this is a joint. There are 360 of them. I'm not a physician. But if you go to doctors, Muslim doctors, they can manage and find the way and the count. And we believe this. Even the doctors say not. We believe the Prophet what he had said, alayhi salatu wasalam. And we are told that every joint requires a charity. So we have to pay 360 charities a day. If it were in ringgits, how much a month would that be? Like approximately 11,800 maybe? I'm not good in, in math. Yeah, that's a lot. So the Prophet is opening other venues for us, for means of charity. So he says, every single day, okay. So a good word is sadaqah. A good word, when said, is a charity. Then he says, a man's helping his brother is sadaqah. A drink of water which he gives is sadaqah. And this is what is related to the chapter. The virtue of providing drinking water. And what else? Removing something harmful from the road is sadaqah. Let us get back to the issue of intention. Maybe just to clarify it and to try to ponder upon it. What I say might be right, and there is a possibility that it is wrong. We said that whatever you do has to have what? The intention in order to be rewarded. But come to think of it, this might be looked into from a different angle. What is that? The things we do are either transitive or intransitive. What do we mean by, this is from my, from my head. I don't know if the word even apply or not. Transitive and intransitives are used with linguistics and grammar. And I have a BA in linguistics, so I could not find a better way. In Arabic, it's lazim wa muta'addi. And it's the same words are used in grammar. So the verb, I sit, is intransitive because it doesn't have an objective afterwards. I write a letter is transitive because the objective is a letter. In ibadat, it's either intransitive, such as praying, I pray for myself, such as reading the Quran, I do it for myself, or transitive, I give you water. I help you carry something. I teach you an ayah or a hadith. So it seems that if it is intransitive, it requires an intention to be rewarded. But if it is transitive, it is helping someone else 
there are two degrees and two levels of reward. Whatever good you do with the intention of pleasing Allah and for the sake of Allah, you're, you're rewarded what? Twice. But if you do it because it's a good deed, not intending it is for the sake of Allah, you will be rewarded. But far less than the double reward. So this seems to be yani, the most suitable answer to the issue that a lot of the brothers may be asking about, which is intention. When you look at it from this aspect. Therefore, if I was walking on the road and I found a branch with thorns in it and I remove it, is this a good deed? If I do it for the sake of Allah, because the Prophet told us والسلام, that Iman is 70 plus branches. The highest is what? La ilaha illallah. And the lowest is removing harmful things from people's way. If I'm doing it because of this, I get what? Two rewards. If I do it without anticipating the reward, I just do it for it's something human, something good, something beneficial. But not for the reward. I will get ajr, but much and far less than this. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. So 360 joints, we have to give water. Is providing water a good deed? How good? Would I be exaggerating if I say it is the best charity? No. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, in the authentic hadith authenticated by Shaykh al-Albani, afdalu sadaqah saqyul ma. The best charity is to provide water. La ilaha illallah. Providing water. It's the best charity. So if you want to be part of that, look at the places where they don't have wells and help digging, provide water. I feel so happy when I see Muslims in Ramadan providing water, of course not in the daytime, huh? after Fatur, for the worshippers when they're doing Taraweeh. In Saudi, this is a habit. Do you have it here? Huh? In Saudi, you get... After Maghrib, loads and loads of boxes of cold iced water and they place it in front of each one. And the worshippers during Taraweeh, they consume two or three bottles. And we never know who brought them in. Yani the masjid I pray in, we never know who brings in them. We just find trucks and trucks bringing bottles of water and mashallah providing it. So this is a charity. But what about the remaining 359? And this is every single what? Every single day. Alhamdulillah. Allah Azza wa Jal had made an easy way out for us. The Prophet said in an authentic hadith, whoever prays two rak'ahs of duha, this suffices for the whole 360. Two rak'ahs of duha. A lot of the Muslims, I was one of them, never prayed it. 23 years ago, I was a preacher, I was an imam. I've been an imam for the past 30 years, alhamdulillah. Giving khutbah every single Friday, requiring research. And where I get my knowledge from? From this research. And 25 years ago, I was a teacher. Every single day at 10, 10.30, one of my colleagues in my office, who has no beard, Saudi, who has no beard, he's not practicing, you know, long thob, normal Saudi, he goes and makes wudu, puts his prayer rug, 
prays two rak'ah, folds his prayer rug, and sits with us. Day after day after day, I felt ashamed. Of course, I did not ask him because I know what he was doing. It struck me that, why am I not doing this good deed? And since that day, with the grace of Allah, I pray it every single day. And now I'm envious. I'm thinking of stopping. He's getting the reward for nothing. <laughs> so I'm thinking, oh, but no, no, no. This is shaitan. This is shaitan. Do not underestimate a good deed. Because someone may learn it from you. And while sitting home, it generates and generates and generates so much reward beyond your imagination. Six years ago, I started my website. And it's not profit-oriented, of course, it's just a normal website. For almost 20 years, I was envious of Sheikh Al-Munajjid. He's a personal friend. Muhammad Saleh Al-Munajid, you know, the, the owner of Islam Q&A website, one of the most reliable and trusted website on Islamic ever. I worked with him maybe 20 years ago on solving questions on Q&A. We know each other. I was so envious. And I'm saying, he goes to bed every single night. And hundreds of thousands are benefiting from his website. This is not fair. It was mind-blowing. Why? Five or six years ago, one of the Romanian sisters, may Allah reward her, contacted me and she said, I'm one of your students. Why don't we make a website and post your questions and answers in it? I said, okay. She did all the dirty work and she's still doing it. I never contacted her. I never heard her voice. I never seen her. I don't know where she is, what she is. But may Allah reward her. See, when you have a soldier for Islam doing something for Allah and no one knows about him, how beautiful would that be? Today, the website, I think, has maybe 15, 20,000 Q's and A's. And she did all the archiving, all the work. I have nothing to do. She gets the questions from the website, sends it to me, and I answer them. Between 200, 300 a day. And now I am gaining the same reward. I'm going to bed, but I get sleepless nights because of all the reward I'm getting. So I'm trying now to cope and adapt. Never underestimate good deeds that you do, or an advice, or a reminder. Allah Azza wa may make this your gateway to Jannah. So keep on sowing the ground, plowing the ground, plowing, plowing. You don't use to. Manish, Arabi, manish. Keep on plowing the ground, throwing the seeds, doing whatever you want. You never know when this tree would take you straight to Jannah. Never ever look down at a good deed. These are good deeds that benefit others. None of them is for your own self. Feeding a, a, a poor person, taking care of uh, uh, providing water, helping your brother. Uh, all of these are good deeds that help others. So keep on trying doing the best you can. Okay. Next hadith, 465, page number 311, 311. Chapter is leniency. Aisha said, Prophet Wasallam said, forgive those who are virtuous, their minor slips. Authentic. Forgive those who are virtuous, their minor slips. What is this? The, the translation is a little bit poor, but the Prophet is telling us, Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Muhammad, 
that Muslims have categories. Some of them are virtuous, pious, practicing. Yet, this does not mean at all that they are infallible. Can there be anyone infallible other than our Prophet Allahumma salli wa sallim alayh? No way. Only the Prophet. So, no matter how high your ranking is, no matter how strong your iman is, you still have shortcomings. So once the shortcomings happen and appear from someone who's righteous and practicing as this individual, what does the Prophet tell us alayhi salatu wasalam? Forgive. Look the other way. Why? Because this is one of so many good things that he has done. This is a drop in an ocean. A drop of impurity does not pollute the ocean. So the Prophet is telling us, Asalam, those who the norm is that they're good, righteous, virtuous, if they make a mistake, if they make a sin, neglect it, overlook it, and forgive it. And this is what they call leniency. This is how we should treat those who are respected, those of dignitary uh, uh, status. That one mistake every few years is negligible. It's a mistake. They will overcome it. Because the Prophet told us Hassan, that every son of Adam is sinful. And the best of sinfuls are those who Repent. So we should not uh, um, make it something that goes out of proportion. However, if someone is constantly sinning, should we forgive him? No. This person has to be held accountable. Someone who is constantly doing wrong after wrong, Tarnishing the reputation of Islam, causing misheave, causing problems in the society. And we say, we will forgive. We will look the other way around. No, you have to draw the line. We're talking about someone who is 99% active, beneficial, virtuous, righteous, but he made a single mistake. Forgive him. Like Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a. Who's he? He's one of the companions who witnessed Badr. On the eighth year of Hijrah, the Prophet ﷺ told the companions that we are going to conquer Mecca. He made a mistake. He wrote a letter warning the people of Mecca of the Islamic invasion. And he gave it to a woman and sent the messenger to go. The Prophet ﷺ received the revelation from the sky, from the heavens, from Allah, telling him about what's happened. The Prophet sent Az Zubair ibn Awam, Ali ibn Abi Talib, and told them that in that particular location, you will find a woman, and the woman has the letter. Bring the letter back to me. They went to that location, they found the woman. They told her, Bring me the letter. She said, I don't have any letter. They told her, listen, the Prophet told us that you have a letter. And he doesn't lie. Either you give us the letter or we'll strip you naked. <laughs> so the woman was scared and she said, okay, dok. She took the letter from her bun. She had long hair. And she gave it to them. They brought it back to the Prophet. He read the letter. He said, Hatib, what is this? Umar ibn Khattab took his sword. Oh, Prophet of Allah, let me make a long story short. <laughs> Allow me to decapitate him, kill him. The Prophet doesn't do this, Islam. He has to investigate, defend yourself. Give me the reason. Don't jump to conclusion. 
any one of us would have jumped to conclusion. Whenever something wrong happens, ask for justification with an open mind. Because you will find a reason for that. Hatif said, by Allah, O Prophet of Allah, I am not a hypocrite. I believe that Allah would fulfill his promise to you and that you will conquer Mecca. But because I am not originally from Mecca, I just wanted to have a favor to them that would not avail them, would not do them any good. They're going to be conquered, they're going to be conquered. But I just wanted them to remember this favor for years to come so that it would benefit my children and my family. But that's it. Now this is an act of treason. So when Umar said, let me kill him, the Prophet said, no. Allah Azza wa Jal has addressed the people who attended Badr by saying, do whatever you want, I forgive all of your sins. So this particular mistake and the only mistake we know about Hatib, may Allah be pleased with him. What did the Prophet do? He forgave it. And this is how we should treat our friends, our colleagues, our relatives. You have a colleague for 10 years. He comes on time, leaves on time, does all the jobs he does or he's requested to do. A week happens and he doesn't come on time. He doesn't deliver on time and you sack him. 10 years that does not intercede for you. Yeah, you look into his matter. Maybe his father is in hospital and he's on and off with him. Maybe his wife is sick or divorced him and he is stuck with two children. You have to appreciate and make excuses. I was praying Isha in my masjid, which I rarely do because I'm not an imam. I'm just a khatib. So sometimes I go to deliver my lectures or I don't have anything to do. So I prayed Isha. I was the Imam. During the prayer, a child started to cry miserably. What is the Sunnah? Hmm? Hasten your prayer. So I hastened. It's an excuse. I want to leave. And so I finished my prayer in a quicker fashion than I usually do. After I finished, I turned around. There was this man and there were two little girls. One of the elders, as the elders usually do. Unfortunately, now I, take about, I talk about the elders. I'm an elder myself. I get people saying, coming, youngsters coming to me. And I think they're going to challenge me maybe in, in, in some sports. Hey, uncle. <laughs> uncle. Yeah, I'm an uncle. So what? So one of the elders stood up. And unfortunately, the elders usually are very loud and rude. And this is a deficiency. The hadith that all of you know, there's another version of it. The Prophet says, whoever his life is prolonged and his deeds are good will enter Jannah. You know this hadith. There's a third addition that people usually conceal and not say. Whoever, man hasu, man tala umuru, his, his age is prolonged. Wa hasuna amaluh, and he has good deeds. And hasuna khuluquh, and he has good character. It is a well-known fact that usually the older you get, the more impulsive and you're not able to tolerate, and your children are afraid of you. Your grandchildren are way, way afraid of you. You're grumpy. You're always complaining. You're always criticizing. This is a deficiency you have to fix. What, why do we bring this issue up? One of the elders in the masjid stood up after the prayer was over and started banging on this brother. Fear Allah, don't bring your children, don't do this, don't do that. You have annoyed us, we cannot pray, we cannot concentrate. The man made a charade, made 
a scene when everybody else was going, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, subhanallah, alhamdulillah. He is making a scene out of it. The gentleman took his two daughters and quietly left the masjid. I immediately opened the door. I have a special door for the imam. And I went and I met him from the other way. And I went to him and I said, brother, forgive our uncle at the time. Yani he's impulsive and he didn't mean anything except good. Yani forgive him, take it easy. He's not from the neighborhood, this brother. And wallahi, the man broke in tears. A grown-up Saudi, he's in mid-30s, started crying like a baby. And I was looking, <laughs> what did I do? And the guy saying, Wallahi, ya Sheikh, I don't know what to do. Their mother left me four months ago, and I'm the only one taking care of my two daughters. She is six, and the other one is three or four. Not my family are willing to take care of her. Not her family are willing to take care of her. I leave my work. I don't have a maid, and I don't know what to do. Wallahi, ya. and the guy started to cry. I felt so bad, but imagine how this uncle felt when I told him the following day, because I met him, and he's one of my students, and I told him, Akhi, look what you have done to that brother. He told me so and so, and, ah, Wallah, I didn't know. Akhi, then don't open your mouth. Seriously. The way the Prophet deals with issues, alayhi salatu wasalam, is our sunnah. You see something wrong? Ask, then act. Not shoot, then ask questions. So the Prophet asked Hatib why, when he got the justification, he forgave him because it was once in a lifetime, a sin that was not reoccurring, so he gave it away. 473. Hadith 473, page 315, 315, chapter Calming the People. Anas bin Malik said, the Prophet وسلم, said, make things easy and do not make them difficult. Calm people down and do not alarm them. Authentic. طيب. This beautiful hadith is one of the etiquettes that we Muslims must share. That is to make things easy and not difficult. The Prophet says, make things easy and do not make them difficult. Calm people down and do not alarm them. Is this what we do? Some of us, yes, some of us know. Making things easy, yeah, he don't complicate things. If someone needs a favor from you, do it. But sometimes you go to a government office and you apply for a service and you find out that the man is causing you problems. So you bring the documents, you said, oh no, you need two photographs. So you bring the photographs, oh no, it has to be six by four. You bring it six by four, it has to be colored. But why didn't you tell me from the beginning? You bring colored, he said, where's the file? You didn't ask for one. No, you have to have a file. You go and bring a file, he says, okay, you have to come after one week. You come after one week, he said, there's a paper you forgot to bring from your office, saying that you work and how much is your salary and bank statement and your wife's approval. We have this in where I come from, making life difficult. If you're a good Muslim, you don't do this. You help not by breaking the rules, nor by bending them, but make life difficult. Treat your brothers as you want them to treat you. Calming people and not alarming them is also essential. We sit with people, we sit with preachers, and they say, all of you in hell, inshallah. Why? You're sinful, you lie, you do this, you do that. Well, if I'm going to hell, then might as well go to the nightclub. Party and have fun. The Prophet says this is not the way. 
you have to calm people. Warn them and calm them. Give them hope and show them who Allah is to fear, actually. And this is why there is an authentic hadith. All of us know. But we don't know the other version, which is authentic. The Prophet came once, addressed the companions. May Allah be pleased with him. And he said, if you knew what I know, you would have cried a lot and laughed a little. You know this hadith. The companions fell into tears, started weeping and crying. The Prophet retired to his chambers. Allah revealed to him. This is the version you don't know. Why are you intimidating and scaring my slaves? Why are you doing this? So the Prophet came out once again to those who were crying. And he said, I give you the glad tidings. Have good hopes and aspiration in Allah and you'll find it. This is Islam. So don't put me down as if I am going to hell forever. Some of the brothers gives khutbah and keeps on banging in their lectures and their khutbah, warning people, advising, which is good. But give us some hope. No matter what we do, we will not enter Jannah unless it is by Allah's mercy. So we do our best. We, thr we thrive to do our uh, uh, level, uh, we strive to do our level best, but we have to not all the time come uh, 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 alarm people, but rather we have to calm them down as well. And we have five minutes.